Good morning. Welcome to Lincoln Community Church. We call this place home. And if today is your first day with us, we want to say, Welcome home. You know, in the Bible, there are over 30,000 verses, and every Sunday I'd like to try to find a verse in the Bible that it encourages us to welcome everyone here. And so I thought that I would just go right to the end of the book. Revelation 21, 22, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Isn't that remarkable that he had 30,000 verses plus? And God decided that everyone, that the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. And isn't that remarkable that here we are today? I don't know what you mean when you say all, but when God says all, he means all. That means everyone on this side of the sanctuary has the grace of Jesus Christ falling upon you. And everyone on this side of the sanctuary has the grace of Jesus Christ falling on you. Not only is the grace of the Spirit of God falling on us, but it's coming up from below. And so, Lord, here we are in the... I didn't want to say it, but somebody got to say it. <laughs> Does the grace of God fall upon our singers as well? Yes. Yes, without a doubt. Finally, finally. So if you're here today, we are going to pray in the name of Jesus. We will sing praises to our God. We're going to do all of this in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we leave this place today we will be able to say in our hearts, it was good to be in the house of the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and call us your children. We thank you for the blessings that we see today, for the blessings that we can put our hand to. And Lord, we would even tell you thank you for the blessings that remain hidden from us. So we invite your spirit to touch every heart, every mind here today. Father God, draw us close. Teach us what you want us to know so that we might grow in our relationship with you. Heavenly Father, glorify your name for we ask these things in the most precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. Amen. If you're here this morning, you have asked Jesus into your heart and you've been born again, your name is written in glory. And all the people said... Amen. Isn't that a blessing? Let's sing it together this morning. A new name in glory. I was once a sinner, but I came hard to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. Oh, the joy that came to my soul 
Now I am forgiven, and I know by the blood I am made whole. Amen? Amen. Thank God for the blood. Here we go. Last verse. In the book is written, saved by grace. Oh, the joy that came to my soul. have noticed when you walked in this morning, there's a bunch of these boxes outside. And one person said, are you going to talk about the boxes? <laughs> yes, yes, I am going to talk about the boxes. Um, we want to see what God is doing with Christmas Child, and it's a really thrilling story. Did you ever wonder how it got started? In 1993, a guy in England notified uh, Franklin Graham, who at that time was doing Samaritan's Purse, and said, hey, could you get some shoe boxes and put gifts in them for some kids in Eastern Europe? And so they rounded up a church in North Carolina and got some, box, um, got some gifts from Canada, and those were the very first shoe boxes. 28,000 of them for the first time. Since 1993, there's been over 240 million shoe boxes go out to 170 countries around the world. And they started in 2009 with a discipleship program after the kids got their boxes. And since that time, there've been over 40 million kids discipled and 20 of them, 20 million plus, are now believers. We've been doing Christmas Child since 2006. And one of our members has been involved in Christmas Child virtually every year. And that's Ed Mentoya. And we call him Mr. Shoebox. And Ed is going to be outside 
uh, after the service, helping pass out boxes. He won't have time to autograph them, so you'll just have to, <laughs> you'll have to just take them and go on your way. So what goes in the box? Well, I was going to, on this slide, I was going to explain a bunch of stuff, and then it takes too much time, and I thought, you know what, everybody in this room can read. So if you open the box, what you'll find in there is a brochure from a Christmas child that explains, you know, what to put in the box and how to, to uh, do a donation because they ask for $10 so they can pay for the shipping and also the printing costs of the stuff that the kids get. So open your box, you'll find that. You'll find a prayer card. You'll find a stick-on label because sometimes you guys find crazy ways to paste the label on the box. And the last thing you'll find are two rubber bands. And the idea is once you pack the box, put the rubber bands around them, and that way it'll hold up as we move it around the church and elsewhere. So I'm gonna click through that quickly. Uh, here's another thought about the box though. <clears throat> uh, we don't know where this box is going. And we don't know which child is gonna receive this box. Now you can specify girl or boy. And by the way, Ed says, you know what this church tends to specify? Girls. So don't forget there are boys out there too. You know? um, but we don't know, but God does know. And so ask the Lord, Lord, who do you want me to send this box to? Girl or boy? What age group? And then what do you want me to put in the box? And my suggestion is when you get your box or boxes, just put them on your table and pray over them and do about, go about your work your thing, go to bed and then get up tomorrow morning and see if you don't have an idea of what God wants in that box. What happens next to the Lord's shoe box now? It goes to one of 4,500 processing centers across the country, staffed by 82,000 volunteers. And then from there, it goes to one of seven processing centers. They're scattered across the country where it gets prepared for international shipment. Sorry. Uh, and then it gets delivered by whatever means it takes, whether it's a horse or people are carrying them on their backs, or they may have elephants that deliver them. And it goes, the box goes to, sorry, get, get it right there. The box then goes to some children somewhere in the world. So here's the schedule. Today is the kickoff day. And it's a, it would be wonderful for you guys to get your boxes today. And the reason is, next Friday and Saturday, the women's ministry needs every square inch of the foyer, and there's no room to have boxes sitting around. So whatever you don't take today, we have to find some place to hide until next Saturday, and then bring them out next Saturday night. So if you want, consider this the sale of the century in boxes. You know, get them while they're hot. Okay, then we'll be receiving boxes or passing out boxes if we have any left on the 3rd and the 10th, and then the 17th is the last day to turn in boxes. Okay, everybody repeat after me. The 17th is the last day to turn in boxes. There were some stragglers last year and you don't wanna be in the straggler crowd. Okay, here's what we've seen so far. We've seen what Christmas Child is, what they do. What do we do? Well, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Look around. That's not likely to happen with the people in this room. But this is going to go around the world. Amen. And now you'll see why do we, why does this church do Christmas Child? Let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Operation Christmas Child is a way for the little children to come to Almighty God. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. 
The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, children are being discipled, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. These children are brave and bold, not afraid, and they're not ashamed of the gospel. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others, and many times in areas where it's an unreached people group. The Bible tells us the time is now. Let them come, Jesus said, let them come. And they're coming. They're coming by the millions. Every single box represents the life of a young boy, a young girl, who will be touched by the gospel. Jesus has come to give them light, that they do not need to be in the darkness, that they have hope, that they have joy. And it is our prayer that this glorious light of the gospel will flow among the nations and will fill our land with the knowledge of the glory of God. The Lord God Almighty desires to fulfill His redemptive plan for mankind in and through each of us and all of us. All of us are children of God. We share this incredible opportunity to take the gospel truly to the ends of the earth by gathering children to Jesus. I believe this year for Operation Christmas Child, this may be the most important year, most important opportunity that we'll ever have to reach children in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray that God will use these shoebox gifts to make a difference in the children's life for eternity. You know, we have been so blessed and blessed mightily, haven't we? Christmas time, Carol and I get together with our family and our grandkids and our great grandkids are there and I'm getting ready to take pictures. I can't even see them because they're sitting behind a mound of presents. Amen? Anybody else like that? Just a mound of presents. And then they start ripping them open and throwing the paper everywhere. And half the time they take a quick look at what's in the box. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Those kids were opening a small little shoebox and they were just pleased as punch to have it. Isn't that amazing? Grab a box if you can and fill that thing up. Grab two. Grab as many as you can. And bring those back on. Yes. All right. <laughs> we have a new song this morning. It's called, We Shall See the King Someday. Not too long ago, I received one of these Connect cards. And on it was written three songs, suggested songs that we sing in our service. We Shall See the King Someday is one of those. You didn't sign your name, but thank you for the request, and we want to honor that request today. We Shall See the King Someday. Here we go.
see that king someday. God bless you. Thank you. Does everybody know what this is for? This is so that you can sign in and let us know that you're here today. And we would really appreciate it if you would do that and print legibly. We would really appreciate that. If you're sitting on an aisle and you see one of these next to your chair there, would you pick that up and pass it back down the other way? That way everybody will get a chance to sign in today. Thank you so much. Everybody know what this is? That's the Connections Newsletter. This is the new one for November. Most of you probably got this through an email, but some of you may want one in your hot little hand so you can take it home and just read every piece of paper and read them over again. Yes. Absolutely. These will be available after the service out in the foyer there. I don't know if you know this, but there's a lady in our church who puts this together every month. Her name is Linda Walsh. Linda, would you come up here for a minute? I don't know... I mean, how many people do you co collaborate with to get, I mean, collaborate? Did I say that right? I just washed my mouth, can't do a thing with it. <laughs> this young lady spent, how many, how many hours do you spend putting this thing together? I'm slow. <laughs> <laughs> but you take a look at the, this is a world-class publication. I can't believe it. We are so blessed, and thank you so much. I do not do this all by myself. There are many of you sitting out there that month after month, you provide me with articles and photos, and I thank you very, very much. I'm the editor. I don't make the content per se. I also want to thank Lois, because Lois Keener is our proofreader, and every month she religiously takes a look at this to see what kind of mistakes have been made. What? Some mistakes? Oh, yes. <laughs> There's always something. And I want to thank Janet Hamill and Bonnie King and Cindy Jacobs because there was a good one this month. And they came in this week after Pam Curtis and the staff in the office printed 180 copies and these three ladies helped me take 180 copies apart and put two new pages in because, because I accidentally sent the draft copy to Pam to print instead of the final copy. So, Well, you, you don't have anything else on your plate, so how did that happen? Old age. <laughs> you wanted to mention something about the craft fair. And I'm, I'm doing this impromptu. Nobody knows I'm doing it, but... What's happening on Friday and Saturday here at this church? Say that louder. And what time is it? And everybody's going to be here with their wallets, and they're going to see what our vendors bring and what the beautiful baked goods that all of you are putting out there to sell. Correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you to all the bakers that are providing all the stuff that will be at the bake sale, too. And thank you. God bless You okay? All right. Um, they wanted me to uh, mention this this morning. A lot of the folks in our church are part of the Lincoln Hills Chorus uh, up here at the uh, Lodge, and they are having a presentation of the Season of Light at the Orchard Creek Ballroom December 13th, 14th, and 15th. You can get reserved seats for a wonderful price of $21 and $24. Amen? There's a flyer out on the welcome desk out there if you'd like to pick one of these up. All right, thank you so much. Our altar flowers this morning, we have two of them. Don't they look nice? Love those. Uh, the first is uh, donated by Chris Hill, 
in honor of her mother Marilyn's birthday, which is today. Happy birthday, Marilyn. God bless you. Thank you, Chris, for providing these wonderful flowers. And then our own Jim and Denise Brown are celebrating their 48th wedding anniversary. Yeah! Happy anniversary, you two. And then Bert and Diane McCullum are celebrating their 48th anniversary also. Amen. God bless you. And, and Sharon Roney, who, uh, who does the uh, binder for the sign-up for our altar flowers, she was telling me there's not a lot of sign-ups uh, coming up, a lot of empty spots there. So if anybody would like to uh, sign up and provide some altar flowers for our service, we would certainly appreciate it. God bless you all. Today, after the service, we are going to be having a welcome to LCC seminar, and that will be in room 122. If you're not familiar with that, you go through these double doors in the back, go through the other set of double doors on the other side of the foyer, and go down to 122, down by our library. Uh, if you are signed up, if you're not signed up, and you just want to come to the class and hear more about um, our values and our goals and our mission here at Lincoln Community Church, just want to know more about what we believe, come and join us. We'd be glad to have you. We'll feed you a little lunch afterwards and give you the grand tour of Lincoln Community Church. And then and maybe we should get some T-shirts, Pastor. And You know, I took the tour at, at, at LCC. You know, that'd be great. So anyway, if you'd like to be a part of that, you join us after the service this morning. And also, tonight at 5 p.m., the Winds of Faith will be here. They are a concert orchestra. We've had them before. You've probably seen them before. They will be back tonight at 5 o'clock, and uh, it's a free concert, but they will be taking a love offering. You know, we were talking about Operation Christmas Child and all the boxes and stuff. You know, those, didn't get, those boxes didn't get made by fairies overnight. We had a bunch of people in our foyer this week who were folding those boxes, and God bless all of you that showed up to fold those boxes. But they realized after a while that they needed a couple more box folders. So, you know, they didn't have to be good. They just had to be able to follow instructions. So they found these two nitwits. <laughs> and, and you'll notice they put my wife, Carol, at the same table to keep us on track and we didn't lose our, our focus. So. So thank you all for coming out and, and, and folding those boxes. God bless you. <laughs> Next Saturday night, uh, you need to fall back. Not literally fall, okay? <laughs> no. You need to take your clock and turn it backwards one hour, okay? Because if you don't, you're going to miss church next week. All right? So don't forget to fall back next Saturday night. And then um, in two weeks, we're going to have a movie and hot dog night. And that is going to be The Unsung Hero. It was going to be the new movie out called The Forge, but that is unavailable until after the new year. So uh, two weeks from tonight, Unsung Hero, Sunday, November 10th, hot dogs at 5, movie at 5.30. Have I forgotten anything? Who knows? Half the time, this is my, these are my notes, okay? I write those down diligently every Saturday so that I'm ready for Sunday morning, and then I get up here and forget half of them. <laughs> Welcome to our world. Hey, amen. God bless you. <laughs> we, we have a uh, prayer room over here on the side. The doors are open. You can see it there. Every Sunday we have an elder over there to pray with you after the service if you feel like you need somebody to help you or, or pray with you. You don't have to pray with them. You can just go and pray on your own. It's entirely up to you. But it's there and it's available. And every, sun, every uh, Monday morning at 8 a.m. we gather here at the church and we have prayer for an hour. And if you feel like you would uh, like to join us for that, we would love to have you. So... 
As Jim plays softly for a minute, uh, you may have someone on your heart this morning, heavy on your heart, and you just need to bring them to the Lord. Do that now, if you would, and let's have a moment of silence, and then I'll close us out in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here today with our brothers and sisters in Christ, being able to sing songs, hear the Word of God. Father, there are so many people in our church who are sick and hurting, in pain. And Lord, we pray that you would give them your peace and your comfort we can offer condolences, we can offer our prayers, but Father, what they need is you. They need your presence. They need to know that you are there with them. So we pray that you would let them know that you're standing beside them and that you're giving them your peace and your comfort. Lord, we found out just before we came up on the stage this morning that Bill Beal went to the hospital this morning. He was here and then it felt like his heart was racing. And so he left and went to the hospital, Lord. So we pray that you would be with him and his family. Lord, that you would uh, see him through this. Give him peace and comfort, Lord. Be with the doctors and the nurses as they try to find out what's going on. Lord, we pray for our country. Lord, we got nine days left before an election. And Father, we pray that your will would be done in that election. That you would put in the leaders that you have established for that position, Lord. Not because of us in some popularity contest, but because you willed it to be done, Lord. We pray that you would be with Pastor Jody as he brings the message this morning. We pray that you would fill him with the words that you have for your people and that you would open our hearts and our ears and that we would receive what you have for us. And Father, as we take our offering this morning, we pray that it would go to honor and glorify you, that it would help to build your kingdom here on earth, Lord. And Father, we will close, as we do every Sunday, how you taught us in your word. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you.
Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Uh, where'd she go? <laughs> Out the back exit, yeah. So, God bless Karen Eulajan, amen? amen? I've entitled the sermon today, God's Wonderful Light. If you have brought your Bible to church, please find your Bible, uh, open it up, turn to the New Testament. We will be in the book of First Peter today. That's the first letter that Peter wrote. It is the seventh book back from the end of the, uh, the Bible. I don't know what your Bible reading program is, but I read the Bible through. And last month, I finished um, the book of Revelation. And what I usually do is I close the book and then I open it to the very front uh, of the book and start one more time. So that means a couple of months ago I was reading First Peter. I woke up a couple of weeks ago and I put my feet on the ground and I had this thought in my mind, the wonderful light of God. I thought, well, oh, okay, that's good. I walked to the kitchen, I grabbed my water and I had that thought again, the wonderful light of God. And as I'm walking to my office, I had that thought again, the wonderful light of God. So I turned on my computer and I typed in the wonderful light of God. 1 Peter 2.9. You see, I had read that months before and I think that the Lord was working on me about the wonderful light of God. Of God. It reminded me of the Psalms, the book of Psalms 16 7. I will bless the Lord who counsels me. My mind instructs me at night. It seems like for a couple of months I've been working on that. Has that ever happened to you? That you have a problem, a question, something that's going on in this world, and you sleep on it. And the next morning, all of a sudden, there's an answer to it. So I'm thinking that's what happened. I read 1 Peter a couple months ago. A couple weeks ago, God said, the wonderful light of God, maybe there's something that he wanted me to know. And if there's something that he wanted me to know, maybe I'm not the only one he wanted to know. Uh, know that. 1 Peter 2.9, Peter writes, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God on the day of visitation. In the autumn of 2024, do you think it's possible that sometimes we take things for granted these days? Do you ever catch yourself taking some of good things that we have and taking them for granted? For instance, Trisha and I have lived in the same house for 25 years. We've never had a tree on our property, and yet every autumn, every tree in the neighborhood seems to deposit their leaves on our front yard. We live at the end of the block. Our house is an L-shape. 
It, it happens every year. One year it was so bad that for, for our anniversary, I bought Trisha and I his and her rakes. <laughs> now, I, I want to let you know that I'm kind of a romantic kind of guy, so I gave her the big rake. This year, we decided not to do that. So last week, when it was a little bit windy, we hired two brothers to do that for us. And while they gathered the leaves just fine. <laughs> they did not finish cleaning the leaves off of our lawn. And they still charged us $40. Do we take things in life for granted? Yes, all these many years I was complaining about the leaves, but I failed to realize how blessed I was. Those leaves in our yard, our grandsons got so much pleasure. And Trish and I will have this picture in our minds forever. You see, I took what I had for granted. Too bad for me. Another example, many of you know that I'm a worker. I like to get up early, get close to Jesus first thing in the morning. So I get to church early. I find that if I get here early, I get more work done faster. The truth is, at 6 a.m., there's not a lot of bosses and there's not a lot of customers at the church. And that's my day off for crying out loud. Now, sometimes Trisha gets up at 7 or 7.30, and there are times that I'm at home when she gets up. And she walks around the corner, she goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, I, I live here. <laughs> Last year, I was walking into church early in the morning. My, soul, uh, my cell phone went off, and it was a friend who also gets up early. And I looked at my phone, and I saw the picture that she sent me. I paused. I remember standing in our parking lot between my car and the front door. You see, me and my friend, we live in the same city. I had not noticed the sunrise like she did. What a dope I am sometimes taking the things around me for granted. And when I stop to think about this place, I appreciate that this place is our home, that this is a place that we get to worship. What tremendous blessings, what tremendous privileges we have if we just remember there more, those things more often and not take our blessings and privileges for granted. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have invited us into your throne room to make our requests known to you. And so, Lord, for the next 10 or 15 minutes, we pray that you would keep the world outside these doors, that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts and our minds. Heavenly Father, let your Spirit move our feet to service for the glory of your name. And we ask that you would answer our prayers, for we ask them in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Peter 2 9. Peter writes, But you are a chosen people. Now it could very well be that 2,000 years ago, Peter was addressing the people that received this letter, but it was the power of the Holy Spirit that brings that letter today to us at Lincoln Community Church. But you, you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. And I think taking things for granted can be dangerous because we start to ignore the problems that we've, we tend to ignore the blessings that we've been given and the problems start to get multiplied and they tumble out of control in our mind. And to take anything for granted is when we fail to properly appreciate someone or something as a result of seeing it every day. Taking for granted is taking something of value, something that's precious, and do not appreciate it. 
We are given privileges. We are given gifts in our life. And these privileges may be material things like our home, like our car, like our health. These blessings and gifts from God may be emotional like love, but they are gifts all the same. When James wrote his letter in the New Testament, James wrote this, Every good thing given. Every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. What we have, we have from God. And with privileges comes a responsibility on our part to preserve them, to appreciate those blessings from God. You see, our blessings from God, they need to be cherished. Because when we fail to do that, we begin taking the blessings from God for granted. And sometimes all of our blessings can be taken for granted because those blessings we just see as a habit. Our blessings need to be recognized and cherished daily. Pastor J.R. talked to you about our prayer time on Monday mornings at 8 a.m. This last week we prayed all around the room and when we finished, I called attention to every member in that prayer room that every single one of them, every person started their prayer with, thank you. Thank you, God, for our church. Thank you for our volunteers. Thank you, God, for our elders. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And I tell you that because I want you to know that the people who pray for you every week they're not taking the gifts that God has given us for granted. Thank you, God, for all that you've given us. We cannot take for granted the blessings that we have in Jesus. Instead, let us value what they mean for us every single day of our lives. Every morning when we wake up, every evening when we lay our head on the pillow, that way we can thank God and share his blessings with others around us. Every Sunday we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is simply this. God created you. God loves you. You have sin in your life, and that sin separates you from God. And yet God loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. And when you call upon Jesus, you have the kingdom of heaven forever and ever and ever. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Easy to understand, easy to hear. But I've heard people say, well, you know, I've read the Bible one time. It said that Jesus is going to judge us. Well, you know, that's true. There will be a time that we will all come before the judgment seat of Christ. But that's not why he came. In Paul's letter to Timothy... Paul said in Timothy, 1 Timothy 1.15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. He came into the world to save sinners. When we look at the Gospel of John, John 3.16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. Amen. You know, we know what we are by nature. We are sinners. We have set ourselves up as enemies of God by the sin in our lives. And the rebellion of our sin means that we, by nature... We're fighting against God. And we deserve that punishment, that judgment for our disrespect. And so we are separated from God by our sin. But in the Bible, in the Bible, Jesus is revealed to mankind as the only begotten Son of God. Jesus is the Savior of humidity. Jesus is the Savior of humanity. Jesus is not the Savior of humidity. <laughs> if he was, there'd be a lot more people living in Florida. <laughs> so let me get back to where I uh, misspoke. In the Bible, Jesus is revealed to mankind as the only begotten Son of God. 
that he is the Savior of humanity. You see, Jesus is God's plan to save the world. And since Jesus has been revealed to us, the next step is to figure out what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And Peter reminds us that we should always be looking ahead to eternal life and what it means to be, to have those true blessings that are ours coming in the future. We need to walk in His wonderful light, in His eternal light. You see, a portion of our life is eternal, to spend in the kingdom of heaven. And while the eternal viewpoint is good, we do not want to take God's blessings for granted while we journey through this life here on earth. You see, I think there are two extremes, and we need to avoid both extremes by living only in the future or only in the present. And that first person goes through life ignoring the people, ignoring the responsibilities around us, and only focusing on the future. These people have too much heaven on their mind to live for God today. And the other is extreme is the one who's so busy living today. today. And he sees eternity as so far off in the future that it's meaningless to their everyday life. And so when I read Peter's letters, it seems to me they're always looking forward because when Peter is gone, he wants us to remember what is truly important, to hold on to the truth that God has promised to us. And that is that while we were enemies of God, while we walked in the darkness, something has changed. So who are we now? Who are you? Peter says, you are a chosen people. You are a a royal priesthood. You are a royal nation. You are a people for God's own possession. 1 Peter 2.10 For you once were not a people, but now you are a people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You know, that's the other side of the world compared to what we were by nature. We were naturally separated by, from God. But now, now we belong to God. We were rejected because of our sin. But now, we are chosen people of God We were stained by sin, but now we are his royal priests. We were at war with God, but now we are his holy nation. And look at that verse up there for a second. Are we taking those things for granted on a daily basis? What Peter says that you are. Do you think about that on a daily basis? Because sometimes I think we take the blessings of God, the miracles that he's given us, and we take it for granted. So how did that change come about? What caused such a complete role reversal in our lives? Well, Peter reminds us in verse 9, he called you out of the darkness and placed us into his wonderful light. And notice something about these changes. The changes came from outside of our person. Peter writes that we didn't make that change. God did. We were in darkness, and now he's called us into his wonderful light. We were rejected, but now God calls us his people. We had no mercy. But now, God has shown his mercy to us in the form of his son Jesus Christ that is the wonderful light and if you've been a Christian for a long time have you taken that for granted because I think it's possible that we have pause for just a moment consider that we have eternal life in a future with our God because Jesus took our place 2,000 years ago 
Do we ever take that for granted? No, I'm not saying that we take it for granted when we think about our salvation. What I'm saying is we don't think about our salvation enough. See, that's the perfect eternal perspective that we've talked about. So if we're all those things, how does Peter want that to affect us in this day and age? Of course, he wants us to consider that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession for eternity. But that's not where it ends. That's not even where it begins. By God's grace, do we understand that we are all of those things right this very moment? You are all of those things so that you may have proclaimed the praises, the excellencies of God who called you out of darkness and placed you in his wonderful light. And I read that in 1 Peter 2, 9, into his wonderful light. I read that word into. That tells me that's a place that we have already entered into. It's a done deal, baby. We're already there. It's the wonderful light. And I read other translations, and other translations say a marvelous light, a wonderful light. And I don't care what translation you read, whether you say it's a marvelous light, whether you say it's a wonderful light, do we understand? It is a divine light from heaven above. And so when we read this from 1 Peter, our new job is to proclaim God's wonderful light with our life. The things we do, the thoughts we think, the words we speak, they are all opportunities to shout God's praises. And I think that means that we should be in balance, remembering that life here is temporary. But even in this temporary life, we need to be walking in His wonderful life, still glorifying God in how we conduct ourselves. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, beloved. You know, I love reading the Bible when an apostle talks to a church and he says, beloved. Doesn't that show a certain amount of affection that he has for his audience? Wouldn't you agree? Beloved. (laughs) Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God on the day of visitation. What is the purpose of living life in God's wonderful light? First of all, it praises God who rescued us, the God who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Not only does this kind of life glorify God, but there's another purpose. Peter is very direct in his letter. His instructions for us is to live an eternal uh, and honorable life among the unbelievers. And when we live an honorable life, a godly life, a life that glorifies our Savior, we have a positive impact on those around us so that they may glorify God. And I read that in First Peter, and I think, wow, you know, Peter's just a dumb fisherman. I wonder where that boy learned that lesson. The lesson that the way we live our lives glorifies God. Well, then I went to the Gospel of Matthew in the fifth chapter as Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, let your light shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus himself called us to be the light of the world. We are supposed to be that guiding, wonderful light of God in this dark world. We're supposed to shine before men and have it to be so obvious to people outside the church. Let them see our good works, all kinds of our good works. That way, Jesus says, my Father is glorified. Wow. 
Wow, what a giant responsibility that is that God would get glory of others by my good works. Man, that's a lot of pressure. It's a good thing we walk in the wonderful light, amen? You know, too often we take the wonderful light of God for granted. Some people just don't like Christians without any good reason. But by watching how we live our lives, it might cause them to think that there's something different about us. And there is. Later on in this letter, people, Peter calls us a peculiar people. Now, some of you are more peculiar than others, and, and you know who you are. But Peter says there's something different about us. We are a peculiar people. So Peter says that in the end, when the people outside these walls observe our deeds, they will glorify God on the day of his visitation. Because if we live our lives like the world lives, we are likely to give Christians a bad name. And people who don't like Christians in the first place, they will not follow after God. But if we live a life that glorifies God, and if we do not take that for granted, if we walk in His wonderful light, we are able to show that our faith, our faith changes the way we live. And our lives stand out among the unbelievers. Living in God's wonderful light may actually be a part of the reason that someone else is in heaven with us. So hear me. Hear me, Christian. I'd like you to reflect on your faith and the love that your Savior has shown on you. Do that daily. I'd like you to ponder the idea how you live as an ambassador for Jesus Christ daily. Let us remember that we have been called out of the darkness into God's wonderful light. So let us walk by that light and give thanks to our God daily. And who knows? Maybe God will use our life as part of the story to bring another person to faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, after all, he's called people like you and me into his wonderful light. And maybe that wonderful light is for everyone outside these walls. God's wonderful light. Now, I know that I have said that sometimes we take things for granted. That sometimes as Christians, if we've been a Christian for a long time, that pretty soon we start to take our salvation for granted. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are a few of you that go, well, you know, preacher, I don't take my salvation for granted. You're probably right. When you think about your salvation, you don't take it for granted. But are you thinking about it enough? So how do I know that sometimes we take our salvation for granted? Man, it's human nature. We take everything for granted. We love our children. We love our grandchildren. We love our great grandchildren. But the best time of the day spending with our children, our grandchildren, is when they go home. <laughs> Thank you, God, for my children. Thank you, Lord, that they've gone home. How do we take things for granted? I've done the, I've done the math. If you are 77 years old, you have seen the sun rise and set 28,000 times. And you get up in the morning, you walk out to your car, and this is what you say. Well, there's that big round thing in the sky again. No big deal. You don't look at it as part of God's creation. There is a leaf on your lawn, and you think, I got to go get Trisha's rake and rake that up. Instead of thinking, look at this, part of God's beautiful creation. There are some times that we are hungry, we fix our dinner, we put it on the plate, we sit down and we start eating without saying, thank you, God. A friend of mine, Pastor Tom Jones, reminded me, he said that only a dog eats without saying thank you. And how do I know that we take everyday things for granted 
It's because men and women in this sanctuary take for granted going shopping, going grocery shopping with your husband and wife. Your husband is watching the game. You say, can you put your shoes on and go get something from the grocery store? Your wife is coming home from a friend's house and you call her on your way home. Can you stop and pick up something from the grocery store? We take for granted going shopping with our husbands and our wives. Can I tell you something? There are men and women in this sanctuary that would give anything in the world to go shopping, grocery shopping one more time with their husband and wife. Do we take things for granted in this day and age? Of course we do. Do we take our salvation for granted? Sometimes. But we cannot live our life taking for granted the things that, especially when we've been called out of darkness into the wonderful light of God. And if we would remember that every day, every day we walk in God's wonderful light, I can tell you, we're going to start walking different. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name for your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that it touches our hearts and our minds. We thank you, God, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we pray, Lord, as you walk with us this entire week, remind us that we walk in the marvelous light, the wonderful light of God. Let our light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. God be praised. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Let's all stand, shall we? And let's sing that little chorus, Glorify Thy Name. us in prayer. I just want to say thank you, Pastor Jody, for your uplifting sermon. And I was told to remind everyone today to make sure you get your boxes and Christmas boxes as you leave. And there's also at this exit door, there's some boxes too for the people to leave on this side. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, for your love, your grace, your mercy and blessings that you do pour upon us each and every day. And as we stand in your glory and your grace, Father, I just pray that we show others of your word and how you and your son and your son sacrificed itself for us, Father, and for our salvation. We give you thanks. Watch over all of us today and our times leaving and all of our families for healing, strength, and salvation. In Jesus' precious name, amen.